Lord. But we're going to get it right after a while by the grace of the living God. Can you hear me all right? Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 145. And we're going to just begin reading at the first verse. The book of Psalms, chapter 45. 145, I'm sorry. All right. Everybody found it? Say amen. 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 Okay. The Bible said in verse 1, Psalms 145, 1, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another. And that's what I want to especially just dwell on just a little bit today. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. I'll tell you, it would, it would just be good if all men would speak about his wondrous works. Now I'm going to go to Psalms uh, chapter 43. Read a couple of verses there. If you will like to read with me, uh, or, or mark it down so you read it when you get home. He said in verse 3, O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them uh, lead me. Let them bring me unto the holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the heart will I praise thee, O Lord my God. I've never been able to play a harp, but maybe when I get there, I'll be able to. <laughs> May God bless the reading of his word, and may his word go forth without hindrance, and may there be those who will believe the word, for he that believeth on me, Jesus said, shall have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day, St. John 6 declares, I am the bread of life. And he that believeth on me shall never die. What a blessing and what a wonderful promise. Bless your word and we'll praise you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. That we may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Amen. So. I just want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord. Some of the folks have gone to the convention down in Ohio, and uh, we're glad for those that are here. This little lighthouse has been here for about 63 or more years, more than 63 now. And so we thank the Lord that we can be here again and serve the living Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Having been a pastor here at Bible Tabernacle now for 63 years in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I just am grateful to God that he chose this place for most of my life and most 
and a lot of my ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy today he didn't take me to Houston, Texas. <laughs> I had some people there, uh, kid folks there, but there is a church in Houston. Brother Shepherd is preaching the same message that we preach here. And uh, let's pray for those, those precious people that's going through uh, so much. Uh, there's so, so many, so many troubles everywhere, but that's one of the worst that Texas has ever had. And so, uh, you know, this church has sponsored now uh, 50, actually the first offering that was ever taken in the assembly when I come here to start pastoring, uh, the first offering was the missionary offering. That's right. And so that happened down on Franklin Street off of Miller here. But uh, it's been a missionary church. Uh, and, and what has been done overseas has probably been a uh, hundred times more than what we have done here. Just one church that we bought the first lot, second lot, and finally the third lot uh, for the church in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, Central America, is now running over with over 600 people in that church. God bless Brother Casco Amen. in a special way. Amen. I met him the second trip that I ever made uh, there, and uh, he and his father come to talk to me in the hotel. And so we had a good fellowship, and uh, <coughs> I was getting ready to fly out the next day, so uh, uh, they went down then to some friends that we preached to in a little town by the name of El Banquito, and they got baptized. And so we want to thank the Lord uh, for this church having sponsored us. We always pay a part of our traveling expense. In fact, for the last several years, we take care of the first initial flight into the country that we're going. And then by your support and those who believe in the message we preach, uh, we're able to... Uh, go into other islands or other cities and so forth with your help. And we thank you for your support. God bless you all. By His grace, we have preached the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ in more than 55 countries of the world. We've traveled in other cities, but places like Iran, uh, uh, I had no opening. I had no leadership. One year I flew into Liberia, and the uh, Holy Spirit said, not now. And I figured it was because they were having a civil war, and he didn't want me to get hurt. So I said, thank you, Lord. I stayed one night, but now we have several churches uh, that uh, have not been established, and one is being built right now. We've been helping some with Brother Gray. Let's pray for him. Brother Stephen called yesterday and wanted prayer for he and his group uh, up in the east part of the country. But anyway, uh, I, I'd like to just go back just a little bit uh, to let you know that Actually, my, my calling to the Lord Jesus, my first call that I ever had a desire to come and pray, uh, I left my seat and come and prayed up front, a little place some people call the altar. And there's nothing wrong with an altar, but I am happy to say, you can get saved anywhere. You'll say the right thing and repent of your sins. <laughs> and be willing to serve the Lord. It isn't the position in your body, it's the position of your spirit and your soul. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so, it's so true. But I gave my heart to the Lord when I was just five or six years old 
in a little hope, a little hope tabernacle church that my dad had built when I was just a baby. And this is down in the state of Mississippi. And so about uh, nine miles out of Louisville, Mississippi. And so that's where I gave my heart to the Lord. The next day when I went to school, there was some young fellow that had been at the church or someone had told him that I went to the altar and he began to make fun of me. And uh, you know, when you serve the Lord, you can expect some persecution. You might as well just get ready for it. But I am forever grateful for one of the deacon's son happened to hear what he said. And he weighed about 225 pounds, although he was just in grammar school. <laughs> and he told that fellow that his name was Philip Coleman, I'll never forget him. He told him, he said, I better never hear you say another word like that to him. You ought to have been down there at the altar praying. And you know, I've never forgot him. I, I hope the Lord remembered him when, if he's already gone ahead of us. But it just shows you, as Jesus said, you know, he said, they hated me, they'll also hate you. Now, that's not everyone. That's those that don't love him. Those who don't care for his word or don't believe in his word. But I'm happy to say, amen, Christians, true Christians love each other. Amen. For we are commanded by the Lord Jesus amen. to love each other. And so when you come to know him who is alive forevermore, amen, <laughs> You will want to testify of Him. You will want to live for Him. And when you fail, you'll feel miserable till you get right with God and just make up your mind to serve Him with all of your heart and soul. Can anybody say amen? amen. So, actually then, I prayed for the Holy Spirit for a number of years uh, because justification, that's forgiveness of your sins, uh, is just a little portion of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is a little more of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when your cup runneth over and the joy of the Lord is so complete in your life. Uh, I will confess to you that I prayed wrong for a few years, seeking Acts 2 experience. I prayed that the Lord would, I, I promised the Lord I'd do anything, anything but preach, if He would just fill me with His Spirit. By the way, He don't make bargains with nobody. <laughs> he. He makes the contract, and if you love Him, you'll sign it. <laughs> and so, and so that's, that kept me from receiving. But one night, a faithful minister by the name of Dillard, he come out of Little Rock, Arkansas, but he was pastoring in Mississippi, and he called me and wanted me to go to church with he and his family. So I said, I'll check with Dad, but I think... He'll be fine, and so I went with him. And that night, I heard him say, you know, in those days, everyone, we didn't have a choir loft and choir robes in those days, but uh, the people often would come and stand on the platform to sing, maybe partly because sometimes they only had one instrument, if they were fortunate, uh, to sing by, so it's naturally easier to keep, kind of keep in tune. But I was sitting back, about three seats from the back, on this side of the church, and uh, he just stepped out and said, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll not be qualified for the rapture. 
Well, he wasn't looking at me, but I'll tell you, it was like an arrow in my spirit that just, it just struck me in the heart. And so I decided, I better get it tonight. And so I went forward to pray. Brother, I, I didn't leave any stone uncovered. And he heard my prayer. Finally, when I had searched my heart, repented of anything I could think of, I even prayed for secret sins that I didn't know. Because some, a lot of people disobey the word and don't even know it. Amen. That's the truth because they don't read the book or they don't believe the book, one or the other. So that night, after searching my heart and repenting of anything I could think of, I finally said, Lord, if you'll just fill me with the Holy Spirit, I'll do anything, even preach. <laughs> oh my, I mean within moments, maybe seconds after that, the Holy Spirit came upon me so mightily. I do not know anything that happened except I was still praying. I will say this, when he got through with me, I loved everybody because the Holy Spirit can make you do that. Amen. Amen. And so, I dedicated myself to him. I never wanted to be a preacher. I, I actually wanted to be something like an optometrist because I had heard you only have to go to school three years. But uh, when I wrote the school, when I got to the 12th grade, I uh, thought, well, I'll write the school, and they wrote me back that now they changed the rules. You have to go two years to a liberal arts college or whatever, and then go to their school for three years. Well, I think all of you can add three and two adds up to five, and so Five, if, it, if, it, if they would have wrote me 50, I wouldn't have been any more disappointed. I began to actually weep like a baby. And I was so sad. But while I was weeping, the Lord in His mercy, isn't He wonderful? Amen. In His mercy and in His grace, I was sitting on the bed in my bedroom and just to my left where I walked in the door a few moments before I read the letter uh, from the school, I heard a voice. It said, do you not know that I've called you to preach my gospel? I said, Lord, is that you? I couldn't see him. And he repeated the same words. Do you not know that I have called you to preach my gospel and then I knelt on the bed and tears began to flow as I prayed for a little while with all of my heart by the way the Bible tells us you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart so as I prayed earnestly seemingly inside of me it just came a question, what would the Lord have to do for you to believe that he's calling you? I begged his forgiveness because remembering Zechariah in the Bible, John the Baptist's father, who doubted until uh, he, he had to go without his speech for nine months right. until the baby was born. <laughs> right. And I begged his forgiveness and I didn't know how to answer that. So I prayed longer, trying to come with a conclusion. And so, I don't know why, but in my heart, I asked five things. Five is grace. And so, I said, Lord, about a half a mile down the road was my father's church that he had been a pastor before I was born. And so... I said, at that church, there's a convention about a month from now. I want you to speak to me during the convention. 
and I want you to let your, the message to me be to the effect that you are calling me into your ministry. Now let me just say, to any young person that is seeking the will of God, let me just say, God wants you to know His will. One man asked me in school a few years ago, quite a few years ago, how do you know you're called to preach? I looked at him, I said, the God who calls you can talk. But wait, you've got to be close enough to hear him when he talks. <laughs> and so that's all I said to him. And he was challenged within a month from that day he received the calling to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God is so good to, to uh, make his way known. So the five things that I asked for, number one was doing the convention. That was a certain time. And to speak to me uh, by tongues and by inter interpretation of tongues. You say, well, why do you ask that? I read in the Bible, like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, maybe other chapters also about the gifts of the Spirit. And so I just thought that if God gave them to the church, the church ought to have them. And we didn't have too many in the church that I grew up in, but that was my request. And that the message would be to the effect that he was calling me to preach his gospel. Well, of course, at that time I was driving a truck for Pan Am, uh, Pan Am uh, service stations, I guess they called it anyway. It was from part of S Standard Oil Company. And so I was delivering for my neighbor, who was a very fine Catholic uh, man, and he wanted me to be the driver of his truck. I raised my pay $2 an hour just for working for him. Uh, of course, that still was only five dollars a day, I mean two dollars a day. <laughs> that was still only five dollars a day, but that was better than three. And so uh, I believe it that he understood when I was going to this convention that I was, I was not quite the same. There was nothing, I was very serious because I had prayed a prayer about 30 days ago and I was waiting for an answer. And so I went to the convention on the, on the night before it actually started. Nothing happened. Tuesday, nothing happened. Wednesday, nothing happened. I had asked for two days off. And then Thursday, I was supposed to go back to work. And when I went to work, the boss let me off without even asking him. So I felt, well, that must be the Lord. I was encouraged. And uh, no gifts were operated. However, I remember a man by the name of E. E. Potridge preached for three hours, and I thought it was 30 minutes. That shows that he was preaching under heavy anointing, and I was, you know, he just preached to everybody in the church beginning at the Sunday school teachers all the way up to the pastor, the evangelist, and, and everyone else. And so, uh, anyway, uh, that's that uh, impressed me greatly, but there was no gifts of the Spirit. So I go on Friday back to work, and needless to say, I was just a little shaken because nothing, nothing had fulfilled my request yet. And so on Friday, the one who preached the day before began to lead in courses and songs. And as he began to lead us in courses, just songs of worship and songs of praise. God loves to be praised, and he deserves to be praised. Amen. And so uh, as, he, as he began to sing about the second or third course, uh, I was, I was uh, sitting kind of back toward the back, but there were some over in the left-hand side of me back to the very back 
And there was a woman who stood and began to speak in tongues. I wanted to see who it was, but there was such a holy hush in that, in that tabernacle and people being reverent to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. And so I didn't look. I never did know actually who it was. They were from out of town, I'm quite sure. And so I thought, uh, the, the, the song leader actually had the gift of interpretation, so he gave the interpretation, but it wasn't to me. And so then we thank the Lord for speaking, and lo and behold, another message. And I thought, perhaps. And the interpretation came again, and it was to someone, but it wasn't to me. And I'm just hanging on. <laughs> And like David said, my foot almost slipped. And so then we worshiped the Lord. And, and before we started another song, the woman gave another message. And the same brother interpreted that message. And while she was speaking, I did not understand one word. But something in me was jumping up and down. I call it a witness of the Spirit. And so I knew this is my message. I don't know what it's going to say. But I was very happy. And if I hadn't got that, I wouldn't be here today. And it just was very simple. Fear not that I have called you to preach my gospel. Go and I will go with you always, even to the end of the world. And I knew that was mine. He said, I would suggest that all of you that's been spoken to by the Spirit would just simply obey the word of the Lord that he spoke to you. I remember hitting that side of the altar and someone hit this side. I didn't know who, but in just a few moments, there was many people down praying and seeking the Lord. You know, when you're seeking the Lord and seeking His favor, it pleases the Lord very much. Amen. And He loves to be worshipped. And especially when you come with a broken and a contrite spirit, that's when He can listen and He will hear. And He, look, no prayer goes unanswered. He doesn't always say yes but he always listens. Amen. And so may God help us this morning to just move on as quickly as we can here. So I begin to preach. Then uh, I told my dad about an hour after that, and I begin to preach uh, the gospel uh, in 1951. So when I told my dad that he had called me to preach, he asked, uh, he encouraged me to go to school. I remember his words. He said, if I was going to have a, a doctor to operate on me, I'd want one that had experience and that had really studied and was good at what he was doing. And he said, uh, you know, I haven't had that privilege to do that, and I just hope that you will be a good preacher. And I thought, well, that's up to God. But I found out that it does depend on your dedication, your, your study, because if you don't know the scripture, you cannot quote the scriptures. In fact, uh, it reminds me of a young man that was preaching in my church in California. Uh, his, his, uh, his job was in a union where sometimes he would give speeches to 1,200, 1,500 people in a union meeting. And when he come to preach, I noticed when he was getting <laughs> opening the Bible, his, he'd be shaking. And I said, uh, Brother Coy, why are, you sh why are you shaking? Oh, he said, I don't understand it. I, I speak to all of these people at the union. And I smiled, I said, when you get to know the Bible as good as you know the union rules, I said, you'll be able to speak 
without trembling. But we all speak with fear and trembling as far as what we say because the judge of all men will judge what we say. Only if we speak the truth will we get a, a blessing from Him. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, but with the, with the message that I had always heard from my youth was the message of justification, sanctification. You know, Martin Luther had a great ministry on justification. John Wesley had a great ministry on sanctification. But in 1906, at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California, in our country, there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that humble little church. And people began to receive the Acts 2 experience. The gifts of the Spirit began to be operated more and more and more. I don't have time to go into the history of those things, but I do want to say this, that when the Lord Jesus fills you with the Spirit, He gives you every ability to, to pass every test that you will ever have if you will walk in the Spirit. Remember, there is not just one experience and forget it the rest of your life. There is, according to the Bible, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So, may the Lord help us all. And so, that was in 1951 that I received my call. And then in 1952, 51, I went to, I went to Tupelo, Mississippi, about the same time that Elvis Presley was singing for the Pentecostal churches around the, the county and around the city of Tupelo, his hometown. However, later he became so popular when he began to sing rock and roll, he moved to Memphis and became very famous. But when he came to Ann Arbor, some of you might remember the paper came out with big headings, The King is Coming. And I, I, I you know, only know one king, real king. Amen. And that's the King of Glory. Amen. The King who is a Redeemer. And I told my church, I, I, I hope that he will stop that kind of advertising because uh, God is a jealous God and he's not going to give his glory to any other right. except his own. Amen. Amen. So that's all for now. Sorry if you happen to be a worshiper of uh, Mr. Presley, but he has gone to his reward. It's up to God. He did know probably how to pray at one time, and I don't know what he said. And that depends on what he said the last few moments of his life. I do know the thief on the cross showed us all that really it's pretty easy to get saved if you really mean it. When one thief wanted Jesus to come off the cross and, and the other one kind of rebuked him and said, we are here for our cause, but this man has done nothing worthy of what he's going through. And so he told the Lord Jesus, remember me. And the Lord Jesus gave him a word. Amen. This day, you're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. So anyone that thinks it's hard to be saved, just, just, just realize that who cometh to me, he said, whoever cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. But he didn't say whoever goes to any other, any other one who calls himself a true prophet or God. There's a quite a few in America, according uh, to National Geographic, uh, quite a few in the world who now claims to be the Messiah or God himself. But uh, 
According to the scripture, there is only one God. Amen. And so, I think I'll just share with you something uh, that I, I copied this morning. Maybe I'll just quote it to you in, in Isaiah 9 and 6. And it just says, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Amen. Said the government shall be upon his shoulders. And I should read it so I wouldn't miss one word. But I'm, you can read it in Isaiah chapter 9. Said his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Sorry about those of you who believe there's three gods. I'm, I'm very sorry the Bible don't back you up. Amen. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And so may the Lord help us to get it straight. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, if you read between chapter 40 and 50, you'll find many verses uh, declaring the same truth. One of those verses, it'll tell you, if there is another God Beside me, I know not any. So if you happen to meet anybody that worships more than one God, uh, especially the Hindus that have about, last I heard, about 52 million, they can't name them all, but nevertheless, if there is another God, he said, I know not any. So I'll just say, if you know more than one, you know more than God does. And I would be ashamed if I were you. Amen. But anyway, I'm not here to rebuke anybody. I can't judge you. But there is one who will judge you at the end of the day. Amen. When we all come before him one time to be judged of the things which we have done in our, in our flesh, in our life, and in our, in our habits and so forth. God help us. I can't judge you. But he said, the word that I speak unto you, they will judge you on that day. Amen. So I'm just saying, read the law book. <laughs> read the word that's going to judge you. There's only one book that I know. Although many have spoken truth, that also if it's truth, it will be according to this. So God bless you. Now, when I went to Bible school, I met a little girl, a little lady, I should say, and uh, she went up to play the piano, and I love that long black hair. It really got my attention, and I thought I'd like to see what she looks like on the front side of the head. <laughs> and when she played that piano like an angel, hey, I was impressed. But what impressed me was not only the beautiful music she gave. By the way, she happens to still be the first, the first lady of Bible Tabernacle, <laughs> if she'll let me say that. And so, uh, anyway, what 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 really uh, appealed to me was her character, her character, because I noticed that when she went to pray, I'm not sure what she was praying for. I wasn't close enough to hear her. But later she did tell me she was praying for a Christian husband. And of course I'm praying for a Christian wife. And so, uh, but we're going to school now at this time. And so when I finally, finally, in the end of the year when she was leaving school, I got the courage to tell her, I love you. And she said, I like you. <laughs> and I was a little disappointed, uh, but she wanted to talk to her daddy and be sure everything was going to be all right with her daddy. Well, that's good. That's very fine. But anyway, uh, in 1951, I preached, uh, uh, 52, I preached in Arkansas, and there some people came uh, to, to hear me preach from here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Two sisters in, in the church, as it were, that knew the same Lord that I knew. 
And we had a three weeks revival in a little place called McDougall, Arkansas. Uh, not too far from, uh, uh, not too far from Corning, and uh, even, uh, even in the area of Missouri there. But uh, that's not important. I will say that my next meeting was, was uh, Los Angeles, California, uh, where the ABC was coming to meet, and since I was one of the officials in the board, uh, I was planning to go. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we went there. I was very fortunate. You know, three weeks preaching, they actually took three offerings for me. The total was $33 for all three weeks. And I'm not complaining uh, because my uncle who lived just eight or nine miles away said, I'll, I'll take you to Los Angeles if you'll just buy me a tank of gas. Well, I was able to do that. And so uh, uh, I was on my way there. So from there, I would go direct to Twin Falls, Idaho, to meet her parents and ask her dad for permission to marry his daughter. And so Brother McGinnis, who was a fine Christian man, he was uh, on the church board uh, for many, many years of the uh, Pentecostal Church, a very fine church in Twin Falls, Idaho. And, you know, when I got ready to ask him, he was under the hay baler for <laughs> working on it. And I, I thought, well, at least I'd run while he's under there. But I thought, no, if he gets excited, he might bump his head and I'll be in trouble. And so when I asked him, he graciously said, well, he didn't want us to be in too big a hurry. And uh, I told him, no, we was not getting married that summer. We're actually going to wait for another summer. And that was hard, but it's easier when you aren't seeing them every day and with them a whole lot. And so uh, then he said, well, <laughs> he, he didn't want... Uh, he didn't think it ought to be too long either. And I knew then I had, I knew then I had the victory and had his permission to marry Norma, my, my only wife. Amen. You know, the Bible said she should only have one. And so the husband of one wife. Well, anyway, that's another whole whole story, so I'm not going to. Uh, the one thing I forgot to tell you, in, in the same church I gave my heart to the Lord, there was, there was one thing that I've never forgotten that happened when I was very young. There was a girl just about my age or maybe a year older. She was the daughter of a deacon in the church. His name was Brother Ed Coleman. And so he brought her up for my dad to pray for at the end, toward the end of the service. She had a, a huge cavity in her, one of her teeth. And it was just very, very painful. And so uh, when my dad and her dad uh, prayed for her, uh, she went back to sit down and told her, Daddy, I can't feel the cavity. I have no pain. I can't feel the cavity. And they checked. And God had actually filled the tooth. Amen. All I can say, I would like to have faith like that. Amen. And I believe anyone that has the faith can have whatever you say and doubt not in your heart. She married a preacher, Brother Hankins. And... Uh, and was a very faithful wife. Anyway, at that same time, I forgot to tell you, my, my dad, uh, he, he was given three acres to, be, to put a church and a parsonage on. And the man that gave it was because my dad plowed the fields for him, I guess you'd call it on havers. You know, they would have the profit 
and uh, dad didn't have any team or anything at that time so the man furnished the horses and the plows and I would go to the field with him when I wasn't in school and sometime I would run trying to keep up with the horse until my little legs were wore out. Anyway, uh, uh, I just, uh, I just want to say that the man who helped my dad saw the logs with a cross-cut saw. That's a saw that has a handle on both sides about six feet away. And so uh, the, the Christians, uh, they all were farmers, so they were what they were calling laying by the crops. That means the last plowing for the cotton. You know, it's kind of necessary because when the cotton gets too big, the single tree of the horse would, would tear down the cotton stalks. And so they call it laying by. And they were all very busy getting that done at that certain time. But there was a man that didn't claim to be a Christian. And he actually, being a veteran, he had a little income because I believe he got wounded uh, when he went to the war. And so he, uh, he told my daddy, if uh, nobody else will help you, I'll help you. And so dad said, can you pull a crosscut saw? He said, if you can, I can. So he got sober <laughs> long enough to saw the logs. And they hauled them to the sawmill. And <clears throat> the sawmill man said, I hate to charge you to saw those logs. He said, let me call the men that work for me. If they'll work free, I'll saw it free. And they didn't know that Dad had such little money. All the money that came into the church for the building program, the entire time he was building was 72 or $74. My dad told me that many, many years ago, and I've never forgotten. You said, how in the world? Because they donated logs to him. The, the farmer donated the wagon to haul them. The sawmill did it free, and he hauled it back, and then the people began to help him put the church together. A 40 by 60 church, which is actually bigger than this church here. And so uh, it was, uh, of course, no glass in the windows, <laughs> a homemade doors out of lumber, but <clears throat> And it was sawdust for a little while for the floor. But finally, they had lumber and they put in the floor. In fact, the people had a habit of coming, especially in the summertime, about a half an hour or an hour before church. And I remember my dad and the deacons and the men walking back in the woods just a little bit and having a prayer meeting for the service that night. While they were out there, the women would kneel in the church. And so I remember distinctly one night, one night, day we were praying back there. Of course, I was very small, but I usually would walk back with them, see? You know, and I, when they pray, I pray too. And so we heard a terrible noise in the church on our way back toward the church. And the women had decided the devil had defeated them so many times, and it had been a while since they, what they call, praying through. I, I, I just wish more people would pray through more often. And they were shouting until the dust was coming out of the floor. And uh, it was dust all through because we didn't have vacuum cleaners in those days, and certainly no carpet as we have here on this concrete floor. But uh, uh, I remember one of the men said, uh, what happened to you sisters? And they said, we just decided we were going to pray until we reach the throne or something like that. And they prayed through. May more churches have that kind of prayer meeting 
Bible Tabernacle could use one, and I think every church in town would be blessed if they could have. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So, uh, uh, the man who helped my dad, I'm going to have to hurry. The man who helped my dad uh, saw the logs to build that church. He came to church drunk one night, and of course, those kind of people usually uh, the only entertainment in the area was church service. They'd have to go 12 miles uh, to, a, to a movie show or something like that. And so, uh, but anyway, he tried to ride his horse. I'm sitting back near the door. And he tried to, to ride the horse into the church. The first time, Dad just kept preaching and walked down the aisle and took the horse by the rain and pushed the horse out of the church. Well, in a little while, he got bolder. And maybe some encouragement for some people that wasn't enjoying the preaching outside. But he got that horse <laughs> quite a ways. It kind of frightened me. And so my dad turned the service over to the deacon. Actually, the deacon should be the policeman of the church, but uh, they didn't realize their position maybe back in those days. And so he went back and pulled the horse out of the church and backed him out and then pulled the rider off of the horse and asked the boys, don't follow me. And he took him around behind the parsonage and had a little talk. <laughs> he he uh, calmed right down then. He was very humble, promised he'd never do it again. And I can thankfully say he never did it again. I could tell you his name, but it's, it would not be beneficial. He's not alive, I'm pretty sure, no. But uh, that was a, kind of an experience that we had that I'll never forget. So when we, uh, when we got to uh, uh, Tupelo and was going to school in 1952, this is the part I've been waiting to get to. In 1952, my dad called me and asked me to come home that weekend. And I asked him why. And he said, because, he said, uh, uh, he said, uh, my, uh, Brother William Branham, that he had talked about for 10 years, or almost, uh, not quite 10 years, that he had met him and heard him preach. He said, he's going to be preaching in Meridian, Mississippi, and I'm going to preach you in my church Sunday morning, then I'm going to take you to the afternoon service. Oh, I, when he told me who, I said, I'll be there. I had no car. Uh, there was no bus going uh, that way exactly. I'd have to go to some big city and hit another bus. But uh, I got out on the street with my thumb. And in about 5, 10, 15 minutes, a uh, man stopped and asked me where I was going. And I got in. and. We went south on Highway 45. He drove about 85 in a two-lane highway. I think the speed limit was 60 back in those days. I said, Lord, you really want to get me there fast. <laughs> but he had a powerful car. And when he got to a place called Macon, Mississippi, he said, now, now I, I'm not going to Louisville, but I'm going straight south, but I'll let you out at 14 that goes right to Louisville. I said, that will be very fine. And so I walked about uh, 20 yards uh, to where the road turns and, and stood there. And the first, the very first vehicle that come to turn the curve stopped and said, whose son are you? And I said, J.W. Johnson. He said, get in this car. I know right where he lives. I didn't remember the man's name, but he took me right to the door of my dad's house. So 
Then I preach Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon we go to some of the greatest, greatest meeting I had ever been in in my life. And so I'm not a worshiper of any man. But when Brother Brandon began to preach on the Godhead, and fortunately, my dad had taught me that there's only one God. And you know, scriptures like, you know, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. You can check it out in 1 Timothy 3.16. And scriptures like, Thou believest in one God, thou doest well. Amen. Now that don't save you just, just believe in that. Because he said the devils also believe and tremble. So anyway, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we enjoyed that message immensely. I want to tell you one thing that happened in that meeting quickly. Uh, the pastor, Wes Busby, Busby, that we had known for many years, he had preached for my dead revival meetings. And uh, so he had two twin boys who used to tease me every time we would meet because uh, one was Wesley and I don't remember what the other's name, maybe Leslie or whatever it was, they would ask me which is which. And I never could tell them apart. But one of them became very sick during that meeting. And they took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, go, let's take him to the hospital. He's got a serious rheumatic heart condition. And so Brother Busby said, no. He said, not, uh, not before Brother William Brenham prays for him. After he prays for him, if there's a need, that'll be fine. And so he asked Brother Billy Paul, who's a gracious uh, man, a son of Brother Brandon, that always kind of tried to protect Brother Brandon from the public. But he asked uh, that son, Billy Paul, he said uh, he'd like to take his dad to the hotel after church, that man, because he just thought he'd have his son get in the back seat because there was no prayer cards given and so that night and so he asked the boys to get in the back seat and uh, he took him to his room in the car. Brother Brandon was testifying the good things that had happened and so forth and Brother Busby's thinking I've got to get in this conversation to tell him about my son. But before he actually did ask him or tell him what he, he had in mind, Brother Brenham said, are these your two sons, Brother Busby? And he said, yes, sir. He said, well, I don't know whether you know it or not, but one of them is very sick. He said, yes, sir, I took him to the doctor today. He said, well, I don't know what the doctor told you, but he has a serious rheumatic heart. Now, up until this point, you know, you could think somebody told him, but that was not the case. He just, back in the back seat, these boys, <laughs> he said, it's this one. And Brother Busby, of course, took a, a little glance. He said, yes, sir, that's the one. And he prayed for him, and the boy was healed. One of them is preaching now. I don't know for sure which one in the same city of Meridian, Mississippi. So anyway, when I heard that he pointed out which one of those twins, because they would tease me because I couldn't tell one from the other, then I said it has to be a prophet. Nobody but a prophet could do that. And I still believe he was a prophet. So anyway, from Meridian, we went back to school. I was very fortunate to have a teacher in school whose name was Sister Ruby Martin. She had polio as a child, 
and she went to Moody Bible Institute. But one thing she said, of all the Bibles she taught us and, and tests she gave us, she taught us one thing that the organization did not agree with her, and she couldn't say it too many times, and that was this. Before Elijah comes, before Jesus Christ returns to the earth, Elijah has to come first. Well, that's what the priest of the Old Testament taught. You know, that Elijah had to come first. The thing was that when, when John the Baptist, you remember, after Elijah, was Elisha who had a double portion. Is that correct? And then when John the Baptist appeared, the same spirit of Elijah, not the same, not, I don't know how to say it, not reincarnation, I'll tell you that for sure. It was just the same spirit that knew how to yield to God and obey God. I guess that's the best way to say it. So he promised in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, not only would there be the Elijah that would turn the heart of the, of the children to the fathers, which referred to the Jewish children, as it were, and churches, to the old uh, prophets of old that wrote the Bible, the Old Testament, but also there would be another Elijah that most people have not recognized, but now it's going throughout the world, and it's about to turn this world upside down if they don't listen uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To let them know that there's another Elijah that is to come in our day. And just like John the Baptist was not recognized, they have not recognized as a whole this one either. Because they asked Jesus, why did the scribes say that Elijah make it... Uh, it's going to come first. By the way, that's Matthew 17, 10 and 11, if you'd like to read it in your Bible. He said, uh, so they asked Jesus, and he said, truly, he said, Elijah shall first come. By the way, the Greek word shall is future tense. It shall first come and restore all things. But I say to you, he's already come. And they, they did to him evil things, so shall they do to the Son of Man. So I'm just trying to just point you to scriptures. If your heart is open, if you're honest with God, if you're not afraid to forget some false teachings you've heard, so you can stick with the truth. Amen. I'm not here to judge any man. God will judge us all on that day when we stand before him. So I got to meet him. I did not know that he had the spirit of Elijah. I didn't know until 1963, uh, 62, 10 years later, when I moved from here in Ann Arbor to California, we got another pastor to come in here and preach. And I moved to California because a man that had built that congregation was a great friend of mine. And uh, they wanted to choose between two preachers. And I said, no, if the other man will take it, fine. And he said he would take it, but when he went out to preach, uh, there was something that dissatisfied him quite a bit. And he did not take the church. So I said, I will only take it if I can find someone faithful that will come to stand in this pulpit. So that happened in 1960. And so in 61, uh, a pastor from L.A. came over to speak to me and uh, asked me would I be willing to help him invite Brother Branham to Los Angeles area. And I said, do you think we could get him? And his answer was, well, he preached for the Trinitarians. Why wouldn't he preach for us? 
And so I said, count me in. Then I said, we're having a fellowship meeting just a week or two from now. Bring your friends. And then when we're there with all the ministers, we'll just see if they will be willing uh, to sponsor the meetings. So it was either nine or 11 churches. I'm sorry, I should know exactly, but I cannot remember, but every pastor that was at that meeting with Brother Langley and I uh, agreed to sponsor the church. And that brought an invitation then for a revival meeting, a campaign that would include praying for the sick with the greatest man of God on earth since the days of Jesus and the apostles. By the way, by the way, I have, I have a, a copy of that message that he preached in Hot Springs, Arkansas, when I introduced him that way. And Brother Branham uh, said, Brother John, uh, they, they mentioned that my name in the spoken word of God, and, and he said, it'd be hard to live up to that. But he said, you know, if nobody believed me, there would be no need of me going. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to God. I'll take time to read that to you, but not this morning. So we've got to bring it to a close. And what I like tonight, by the grace of Jesus Christ, and by your prayers, I'm going to finish it Tuesday night. And I hope that you'll come to hear it. Because time is really running out. So we've got you in Tupelo, and we, we told you about the Sister Ruby Martin and her teaching. By the way, I invited her to come with my wife and I to Ann Arbor for a vacation. School was out, and she said no, she didn't make fast decisions. But when she found out that I had in my car right that moment 10 messages from Brother William Branham's preaching in Jeffersonville, Indiana on the seven church, uh, the seven seals of Revelation. Then she said, can you wait about 30 or 40 minutes? I think I can get ready and go with you. And she came. And that was a blessing because she could not stay, you know, for very long. She had an aunt in Indiana she wanted to visit. So we heard those, those tapes of the seven seals of the book of Revelation. And as you know, uh, Brother Brennan was out west. He preached in 1962, the last service at watch night service in Jeffersonville in 1962 and said, sirs, is this the time? And so he went uh, from that meeting, he went out west, and then in March of that year, uh, he went out about 40 miles from Tucson and there with several men to hunt Avelina. But after he had gotten his game, he wanted to be alone. He wanted to pray. And so he didn't know when God was going to do because he had seen in a vision seven angels that came down to, to speak to him. But in the vision, there was only one angel that spoke to him. Uh, I'll correct that statement. And that was the one on the right hand side as you count from left to right the seventh angel. But when he spoke in the vision, it was in another tongue, and he could not understand it. But when it was fulfilled in Sunset Mountain, it's called, 40 miles from Tucson, Arizona, seven angels came to visit him. And he said it was like an explosion when they came in so fast. There was a great shaking and so anyway, uh, anyway, as, as he began to uh, uh, hear the angel of the Lord, this time, this time it was 
it was, uh, he could understand it. And the angel just simply said, and I'm probably going to close with this remark, go back east, go back to Jeffersonville, and there I'm going to open your understanding to the seals, the seven seals of the book of Revelation. And so, what a day that was. The cloud, I wish we had a picture of it inside. Yes, the cloud that you see here hanging on the wall, if you could just show that, it would be fine, is the same cloud that was put in Life magazine May 17, 1963. And, and so another magazine called Science Magazine, even a month earlier. But when this cloud came, uh, Brother Branham, uh, they brought the picture to Brother Branham and said, is this the same cloud? It's, what does this mean? But Life Magazine had turned it sideways, the wrong way. So you couldn't see the, the hair of a, of a man inside that cloud, you know. But the Bible prophesied in the book of Revelation, he'd come with hair like wool. How many remembers reading that? Amen. Say amen. amen. All right. And so there it was, hair like wool. The judges of England, as you know, when they come to judge at the Supreme Court uh, of England, they always wear white wigs to give them the distinction. Just sit back in the back, please. Uh, I'd like anybody that comes in to come over this way because we're trying to we're trying to take this, hoping it'll be okay. Uh, so God bless you. And we're going to we're going to bring it to a close as we as we can. But this is the climax, <laughs> really. Uh, anyway, anyway, he came to California to preach, and it was there that when Billy Paul called me, since the brothers had chose me to be the MC of that meeting, uh, he called me to ask if there was a message for their father, and so uh, for his father. And I said, yes, a message from Brother Dima Shukari wanting him to preach Saturday morning at the radio broadcast. And so he said he would talk to his dad and call Brother Shukari. And so I, I said only one other request, and I asked for an interview with Brother Brennan. And Billy, Brother Billy is very gracious. He didn't see any reason why that I couldn't have the interview. Uh, I do not know what happened, except the services were with great unity of spirit. Great faith uh, was demonstrated there. And great testimonies of what the Lord had done in the ministry. And he preached great messages, and I was blessed indeed, and glad to have a part. Brother Langley was the choir director. Brother Potridge gave the prayer request, and so uh, we would sometime introduce Brother Branham, or we would uh, close the service uh, when the service was over after Brother Branham had finished preaching. Marvelous meetings. And I will not tell you the greatest one that helped me, the greatest, not today. I'm going to save it for Tuesday night because I just don't want this uh, to be uh, too long. Because they're hoping to make, uh, if you will, Sister Dorothy, just intercept her back there as we bring it to a close. Yeah, thank you very much. Amen. Are you ready to sing a song with me? Amen. Amen. All right. I was singing all week. I wish I could think of one of those songs I was singing as my wife comes.
I would like for you to I would like for you to turn to 155 in the Only Belief Song book. I'd like for us to sing Peace in the Valley. This song, uh, I heard the man sing it in Los Angeles, California. I remember his testimony quite well. I believe I can tell it. Uh, he, he, he was advertising over the radio and possibly television. I don't remember all the details. But they wanted him to advertise liquor or cigarettes, something of that nature, which he had never advertised. And he refused because it's a curse to the people of America and around the world. It's causing many to die, not only months, but years and sometimes years and years earlier. And so when he refused, then they kind of uh, kicked him off of the program. And so he was going through a little struggle because he made quite well on that. And he, one day the Lord gave him this song, and let's sing it in the only belief song book, Peace in the Valley 155. Amen. Let's start with the chorus. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me. Oh Lord, I pray. There will be no sadness, no sorrow, no trouble. No sorrow, no trouble. 
I'll try on the last stanza just one more. Well, the band will be gentle and the wolf will be tame and the lion shall lay down by the lamb. Oh, yes. Well, the beast from the Sister Dorothy, she's had several heart attacks, and the Lord has kept her alive. Amen. It's in F. He's everything. He's everything to me. He's everything. He's everything to me. He's my father, my mother, my sister, and my brother. He's everything to me. One more time. Oh, he's everything. He's everything to me. He's everything. He's everything. My father, my mother, my sister, and my brother, he said everything to me. Brother Pratt, to pray with me, with my sister here at this time. 
Amen. Do you love the Lord? Amen. 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 Do you believe that God wants to continue to heal our precious sister? Amen. 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 I believe it's His will. And he, she's got great faith. Many times she's come here. Any other elder that wants to come and pray with us, it'll be just fine. And so let's have faith with her because... Amen. Do you have pain in your body now? All right. In your back? Left arm. All right. We better put the, the camera on for this. Amen. She has pain in her back and in her left arm. So, can you raise your hands to the Lord? That will be high enough. Heavenly Father, as we come to you and the whole congregation also believing with us. And Lord, with her faith, she needs a touch this morning because she's not up here just to put on an act. She's here in desperation of another touch from you. You've always been faithful. And you will be faithful until the day you want to take her home. And Lord, you've never revealed to her, to my knowledge, that it's time for her to go home. So therefore, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that every pain will leave this body and this heart will just be a little stronger to pump the blood right out to the arms so there will be no more, no more pain. No more, no more aches. Just, just touch her. And Lord, let the blessings of the Lord rest upon her, not only today and tomorrow, but next week and this month and next month. In the name of the Lord Jesus, have mercy upon my sister Dorothy and heal her for your glory and for your honor. For you said, where two or three will agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done. And now we're here in simple faith. In simple faith. Oh, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, precious Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your wonderful joy. And for the peace that passeth all understanding. And now, Sister Dorothy, I just want to ask you here, the people are watching to see uh, when you came here you had pain. And I want to ask you uh, to raise your hands if you have no pain now. If you have. I want to just know the truth. Amen. No man. Hallelujah. This is God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And the Holy Spirit's all over her. I'm going to ask for Sister to come and, and just help her back to the seat because she's so full of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure she can walk real good, but may the Lord bless and honor her faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Brother Pratt, come on and sing one more chorus as we get ready to dismiss. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. She's feeling better now. And she's ready to go back to her seat. And by the way, if any of you have been looking at this stick, now that this is about close, I'm not trying to be Moses. Because Moses had a stick with a crook on it so he could catch the lambs and pull them out. You know, but Brother Jerry, he just felt led to bring this to me. And it's strong, and uh, 
Uh, you know, I don't think I'll ever need it. Uh, it's got a little horn, so <laughs> I suppose if anyone would attack me to try to kill me, I could use it. But otherwise, I just hope it'll just be a little strength in God. <laughs> and, uh, the Lord bless you. I want you to especially pray tomorrow for Sister Sandy's husband, Dennis. Is that right? And for months I've been waiting for him to call me, and he's going to take me fishing. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So pray for him. Hallelujah. And pray that she'll obey God so that she can lead him to the Lord Jesus. Amen. I may take Amen. this stick tomorrow because I put it down <laughs> in the boat and step in with strength. I don't know. You might need but, it. Uh, anyway, if my fishing pole breaks, I just put a line on the end of it. <laughs> Amen. If it was the tree of life and the sun's too bright, it'll just have limbs and be ashamed. If I get hungry, maybe it'll bear fruit like Aaron's rod did. Oh, right. Amen. God bless you, Brother Pratt. No, I was, that brings to mind one time over in Africa, in the Ivory Coast, where uh, there were some different rods and so forth. But we saw that there was one that had borne leaves, that had borne fruit. I remember that one Sunday morning over in the Ivory Coast. Remember that, Brother Johnson? Amen. Okay. I've forgotten yeah. which tree it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, God Amen. would have us the praises of his people, so this is, uh, we'll, we'll give the glory to Jesus. Amen. We'll give the glory to Lord. And so we're going to read to you uh, some scripture from the book of St. John. If you'd like to read with us, you'd certainly be Welcome to do so. St. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Can you hear me all right? Amen. Amen. Sounds like it's a little better now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, Amen. and the life was the light of men. Amen. We can all say amen to that. Amen. Amen. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, unfortunately, is still the same way with most of the world today. Can right. you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Right. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might be, might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Amen. Even to them that believe on his name. Amen. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right. And the Word was yeah. made flesh yes. and dwelt among us. That's right. And we beheld the, His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full 
of grace and truth. May God add his blessings to his word. Shall we just look to him now? Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege to be a witness in this 21st century of things that happen to me and, and other people and thousands of people were touched by a light that came in this day. Lord, just like John the Baptist, he wasn't, he wasn't the, he wasn't the light that was promised as the Messiah, but he come to forerun the Messiah. And we thank you for his ministry and for the work of the Lord that he bore witness to. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you would just anoint us to say what you would have us to say this evening. We'll praise you for it. Give you the glory and the honor in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're just going to try to just pick up where we left off last Sunday and ask your prayers that we can just uh, stay on the uh, focus as much as possible. Uh, one thing uh, I have always desired and I hope I will always desire and that's to tell only the truth. Amen. Because on that day when we all face Him, I'll have to give an account of what I do, uh, what I say about the truth, and you'll have to give an account for what you've heard of the truth. Right. So we're all going to be judged on that day. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we, uh, we gave a little uh, experience last message concerning what happened in Meridian, Mississippi. Then we want to kind of go to about 1960 after we had come to Ann Arbor here in 1954 by a divine vision in Tupelo, Mississippi. Then we received a call to a church out in Los Angeles. The Mailing address actually was Wilmington, but it was part of Los Angeles, California, called Faith Tabernacle. And so we traveled there and uh, began to pastor that church. Their pastor had left, and so it was left vacant, and the church was, was losing a lot of ground. So I didn't know the reason uh, when I went. But I do know now, because some of the greatest things that's happened to me in my entire ministry happened to me there. There was a man that come to visit me in 1961 to tell me he had a burden to invite uh, a ministry to, to Los Angeles area by the name of William Marion Branham. And he asked me, would I be willing to join with him. And I, I said, uh, do you think we can uh, get him to come? He said, well, he preached for the Trinitarians. Why would he not preach for us? And I told him, you can count me in. And I said, we're having a, a fellowship meeting within the next two weeks, and so we would appreciate if you would just bring your friends and Let's meet together. And so we met together and all the brothers had a little short meeting and every minister agreed to be one of the sponsors of the meeting. The sponsor is responsible for all financial needs that are to be met. Then we invited many, many full gospel churches and called them cooperating churches if they would just be willing to dismiss the midweek service and come to this meeting. And we put them in the same song book that we had as the cooperating pastors. It was one of the greatest meetings that I've ever been in. 
When they arrived in town, Brother Billy Paul called me and said that we have now arrived. And so he asked, was there any messages for his dad? And I said, yes, Brother Dima Shikarian is requesting that he preach on Saturday at Clifton's Cafeteria. That's in Los Angeles area. They had a radio broadcast and they wanted Brother Branham to speak and also uh, to be at that broadcast. And so I encouraged, I told Billy, I would be happy if he could because it would give us another chance to hear the word and uh, also that the uh, broadcast had been a, a special blessing to announce this meeting every Saturday. They would announce it for many weeks before the campaign started. So this was in June of 1962 and uh, those messages are still available as well as about 1,200 other messages uh, that was made of the ministry of Brother William Bradham. By the way, that those who have uh, a way to get on the internet, they can simply draw all of those uh, messages and hear them by simply going to www.williambranham.org. So I think that'd be a good little word and maybe will cause many to listen to it. And so when this minister, Brother Langford, came and we met together, all the churches agreed that was in that meeting to sponsor uh, the meeting. Uh, we were able to get the Great Western Exhibit Center uh, for the meeting. Some called it the Cow Palace, but uh, we found out that Brother Dima Shakarin's father, Isaac Shakarin, actually was on the board. He was actually able to save us 25% by just going to him. So that was a break and a blessing, and he's a very pleasant man. So uh, this was the first time we had spoken with him, and he was happy that we contacted him. So I want to just tell you that the meeting was tremendous. It had tremendous attendance and uh, just outstanding miracles. And so one uh, Billy Paul had promised me an uh, interview. However, because of his busy schedule and the pressures that's upon him, perhaps he had just forgotten. And uh, on Saturday night, I became, I became aware of the fact that this may not happen. But Brother Branham preaching a message by the name of Perseverance, and by the way, uh, that service took place on June uh, the 23rd, 1962, and you can find it for yourself. And so he spoke about a woman that came back east to be prayed for in one of his meetings. She got a prayer card, but she could not stay for the entire meeting. So she... Uh, uh, the last meeting that she could stay, her number was not called. And so she was so desperate, she had someone to help her to the back door where Brother Brennan comes out of the auditorium. When he come out, she caught a hold of his coattail. <laughs> and Billy told her, I'm sorry, sister, I must take my dead. Uh, he's very tired. And Brother Branham said, I was tired too, but just a minute, Billy. And so he prayed a short prayer for this dear sister. And in three days, she passed a 50 or 60 pound tumor from her body. Praise the Lord. And I was, uh, I was uh, just, uh, you know, glad that he said this. He said, she was from California, she might be here tonight and way over on the left side. Now you're going to have to take my word for the rest because 
Uh, the mic was too far away to pick her up, but I heard her very distinctly say, that happened to me 12 years ago, and I'm still healed tonight. Amen. And I just had a Pentecostal jubilee <laughs> when I found that she was there thinking if anyone doubts him, there she is, right. go and talk to her. And so, uh, anyway, uh, while I was rejoicing that she was there, I heard a voice within me say, if you get to see the prophet, that's the way you're going to have to do it. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I was glad to have some instructions. But that night, <clears throat> Brother Branham called all the ministers. There were some ministers, about a hundred ministers on the platform. And he called all of them to come and join with him to pray for a fast line as they come through the line. So he stood here with his back to the auditorium. I stood right next to him because I thought that would be a good place to stand. And so we had a line of ministers, just uh, a very large line, and they began to minister. Brother Borders, Brother Billy Paul began to help them through, uh, through the line. So I remember looking to see where the end of the line uh, was. Uh, maybe half an hour later, I looked all the way to the back door and uh, I was ashamed to look the other way because I never found the end of the line. So I just forgot about it and was praying for those coming through. And there was a presence all around us. I tell you, I don't think the angel of the Lord was too far away. And uh, so, but when I finally uh, realized that there was not as many people praying in the auditorium and, and so forth, I decided to look again. There was only 10 more people. So I just eased out of the line and headed for the back door because that was my instructions from the voice that spoke within me. And uh, when I got there, there was about 15 brothers, and so I excused, uh, asked them to excuse me. I walked through them, and uh, I walked about five to six more steps, and I just said, Lord, this isn't going to work. It's too many. And I heard the voice again. Now, thank God that when he wants to talk to you, he can talk to you. Amen. And the voice said to me, join yourself. To the car. That's exactly what he had said to Philip. The only thing he told him to join yourself to the chariot. Amen. By the way, the chariot was the best transportation back in Philip's day, and uh, he was commanded to join the chariot that the Ethiopian was in, headed back for Ethiopia. And so, uh, uh, you know, that identified in the scriptures and I didn't doubt it one bit so I looked out and saw uh, the station wagon that the full gospel businessmen had purchased one with one offering in fact they wanted to buy a Cadillac and Brother Brennan said no he would not re receive a Cadillac and they asked him why and he said because I have people that don't even have an automobile and I just don't want to drive up uh, to see them in, in a Cadillac. Uh, they, they said, what should we do with the, you know, what should we do? He said, give the money back to the people. But they said to Brother Branham, much of it is in cash. We have no way of knowing who gave it. So then he gave them permission to get a Chevy or Ford. So that is the Ford station wagon that was sitting there. So because it said, join thyself, I went over and caught a hold of the doorknob. It was the old doorknob that had a little button underneath, and I could put my hand into it. And that's about the best way I knew to join it. And while I'm standing there, please, please, uh, uh, I hope nobody is offended by this statement, 
But there was a little voice that said to me, now what do you think about Elijah? And I was just honest with the Lord that whether he be Elijah or not, I really don't know. But one thing is certain, if he is Elijah, I'm going to be like Elisha. In other words, I'm going to hang on <laughs> because Elisha could not be shaken by the people, not even by the prophet himself. And so uh, while I'm uh, thinking and meditating on that, I saw Brother Billy bring Billy, uh, Brother Branham through the line. Uh, I think he shook hands with about two brothers that were standing there, but Billy had him by the arm. <laughs> And he continued, but when Billy saw me standing at the very door, he was wanting to unlock to let Brother Branham in. He said to me, I, I wouldn't mind, Brother Johnson, but I just turned down about 15 brothers. If he stops for you, I won't get to take my dead to the room. And uh, while he's unlocking the door, I turned to the prophet of God and said, Brother Branham, I've got to see you for just a moment. He got in the car without saying anything, but after he got in, he motioned for me, get right in here, Brother Johnson, and shut the door. And I didn't lose any time. <laughs> I actually got in and shut the door before Billy got the other door unlocked. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure Brother Billy's forgiven me by now. <laughs> and I remember Brother Brenham said to him, it's okay, Billy, just start the car and go away from the building down the lane. And that's exactly what he done. He turned to me and said, what do you wish uh, to, to, uh, to say to me or something of that nature? And I said to him, I, I've heard a couple of tapes that you preach. I heard what you said about organization. And I said, uh, I prayed for the divine will of God. At this moment, I don't know precisely what he wants me to do. But I said, I have confidence in you, Brother Branham, that anything you'd tell me in the name of the Lord, I would believe it. So he said, let us pray. And he prayed a little short prayer. He said, the Lord says, I was a little surprised that he started with those words. He said, the Lord says, you just go right ahead for now. He said, but, and, and when he said that, I thought, I thought what I'd heard on that tape, you know, didn't sound like just go ahead, you know. <laughs> and, but I didn't say nothing. But as soon as that thought was in my spirit, he heard it. In his spirit. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And he said, wait just a minute. He said, down the road, something is going to happen. He said, now when it does, you just step aside. And uh, so I thought, I, I hope you'll tell me how I will know. I didn't say a word. I didn't have to. When that little thought was in my spirit and heart, he, he, he said, don't you worry how you will know. He said, you'll never have to ask me about this matter again. In fact, he said, you won't even have to ask the Lord. You'll know when that day comes. I said, that's good enough for me. And God is my witness that it came to pass. Exactly two hours later, almost the same day of the year, uh, that, uh, that the little voice spoke to me and said, remember what I told you that night in the car. So when that voice spoke to me, uh, I gave up my position that I had held with the ABC, they call it, Associated Brotherhood of Christians, by the way, Brother Branham said, I'm ABC too. He said, always believe in Christ. <laughs> and I, I kind of like that. And I noticed a few ministers were smiling when he said that. So anyway, uh, uh, that 
came to pass, and I'm so grateful to God for, uh, for the uh, leadership that the Lord gave me through His servant, uh, the prophet of God. So I gave up my position as the chairman of the ABC, and uh, so I went to the convention within a week after, just a week after uh, the meeting was over in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I asked permission from all the ministers uh, that they would give me their support to invite Brother William Branham for our next convention in 1963 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. One brother was very negative, and I, I uh, was very disappointed that he was the first one to speak. But those who had spiritual knowledge and good sense, <laughs> they all voted uh, uh, to give me the privilege to invite him. So we invited uh, Brother Brandon for 1963 convention in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he graciously accepted. And we asked him to at least give us from Wednesday night through Friday night. And uh, also the brothers had recommended that if he would preach one day service, that that, uh, that would be good. And so on the on Wednesday, when uh, before Brother Branham even got uh, to the uh, to the auditorium in the morning, I went out of the of the meeting because the meeting actually starts on Monday night usually in those conventions, so the pastors could come after their Sunday service, and so I went out, and there was a couple from Missouri that uh, had just driven up and the father and the son explained to me that she had cancer and that she had been so weak for the last 28 days she did not even have strength to sit up and I told them we're going to be praying for your mother. I asked them had they ever attended uh, any meetings of Brother Brandon before? And they said, uh, no, but they had heard many good things. And uh, so uh, that night when I came into for the service, they had her here, just to the left of the pulpit, on a cot. And there she lay. Brother Brandon, as soon as I introduced him to preach the word of the Lord, uh, and he said he was glad to be back in Arkansas again for some of his greatest meetings in the early part of his ministry was in 1946 to 48. He had three meetings in Jonesboro, Arkansas. My dad was in two of those meetings. And by the way, that was my first introduction to the ministry. When Dad began to tell what he saw, what he heard, uh, it was planting a seed of respect and just confidence, you know, because you have to have confidence in the ministry, and then they can help you. And so uh, I went the next day because I had asked Billy to find out if his dad would preach on Friday morning as well as Friday night. And uh, he had not gotten back in touch with me. So this gave me a good excuse to head for Howard Johnson's motel <laughs> on the, right on the freeway from Hot Springs to Little Rock, Arkansas. And so I went over thinking maybe they would be in the room. They might even invite me in. But Billy was standing about 30 yards away from the door. So I just walked over and excused, uh, asked him to excuse me that I just wanted to know if his dad was willing to preach. He said, I've already asked him. He said, if you wanted him to. Well, uh, we asked him simply because we did want him to speak both services. Now, when I turned from him to go back to my car, 
My eyes went across number seven door, and as soon they had the curtains pulled, but as soon as I my eyes hit number seven, the door swung open, and out stepped Brother Brennan with his hand out like this. So I just went over to shake his hand. He said, come on in. And I said, uh, I wouldn't want to bother you if you're busy. No, he said, I already have my message for tonight. Come on in. And so for two hours, we sat there. And on you know, an unplanned uh, interview that I, I was not sure of, but I sure had prayed that it could be possible. I was not going to ask for it. I wanted God to do it. How he knew to open the door with the curtains, uh, it had to be the Spirit. Amen. That's all I can say. So anyway, as we sat, he told me some important things about moving from California back here because I was a little discouraged, uh, you know, uh, having left a church with about 150 or more people quite regularly uh, come back. And Brother Brown just simply said, you know, Philip had to leave a big revival one time in Samaria, and he went for one soul down in the desert. That encouraged me. People like Sister Chisholm, <laughs> amen, that had been so faithful to come, and other people that had just kept the doors open. And we give great, great honor and prayer for them, thanking the Lord with all of our hearts. So uh, he's accepted the invitation and he come to Hot Springs, and so I, uh, I told you about the couple from Missouri, and I want to go just a little bit further. He, he told, the most important thing he probably told me in the room was, he asked me had I heard the seven seals, and I told him no, I did not know he had preached the seven seals, I had asked Brother Billy. Uh, but I should have wrote him a letter giving all the information. And uh, so I had asked him to let me know any time the meetings would be within a uh, reasonable distance. And Jeffersonville is only six hours. Some people can drive it a little sooner than that. But uh, so he said, well, just tell him again. And... Uh, so he had preached the seven seals. As you know, uh, he had given a message in the last service he preached in 1962, Sirs, is this the time? And by the way, that was the first message Brother Branham asked me to hear. And the second one is the breach between the church ages and the seal. And finally, he preached God in simplicity, preparing the hearts of the people, you know, that God works in such simple ways, and uh, the seals was about to be revealed, and so Brother Branham had, had seen in a vision seven angels coming to him. However, when the seventh angel from the left to the right spoke to him, and so while we while we're on that, uh, uh, I hope you can get the picture. Is it, is it here? Uh, all right. I hope uh, they can get the picture there that came out in Life Magazine. The reason I brought the front is to show you that the date was in May 17, 1963. Uh, and so this was after the seals was open, but the cloud appeared before the seals, before the angels came to Brother Branham. And the amazing thing, it was on Sunset Mountain that those angels came down. Now, Dr. MacDonald said that that cloud was 26 miles high. And of course, he said, as we all know, that no cloud can exist 26 miles high. He checked. And there was no missiles, uh, no airplane goes that high. 
and there was nothing that could have made the cloud. However, God can do anything, Amen. anytime Amen. He wants to, Amen. and He don't ask our permission Amen. for any of those things. Amen. And so, I think it's a miracle. Now, Life Magazine had it turned sideways, but when they showed the picture to Brother Branham, he turned it correctly. That's why we've honored it by putting it up on the wall here with the scripture in Luke that I feel probably refers to that cloud. When you see the Son of Man coming in a cloud yeah. with power and great glory, then lift up your head and look up your redemption draweth nigh. Isn't Amen. God wonderful Amen. to tell us uh, 2,000, over 2,000 years ago <laughs> to be looking for this and we've seen it in our day. Amen. And I believe it's a sign of the end time. Amen. A sign that we're closing because he said now Israel, he said Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So because I mentioned to you all ago about, uh, he asked me about Elijah. I feel for the sake of those who've never heard, I must just briefly say that those who study the Bible with prayer and thanksgiving in their heart, they're probably aware that actually God uses the minister of Elijah five times in the entire Bible. The first is the original Elijah. The second was his follower who had a double portion of his spirit. And they called him, his name was Elisha. This is not a reincarnation. This is God just using the same anointing that was so successful in Elijah in the next man, Elisha. And then quite a long time later, in the book of Malachi, it's quite evident, and Isaiah chapter 40 also mentions that there would be one that would come before the messenger, a messenger that would come before Christ, uh, who was of that covenant. And so, it, it uh, those, those who knew John should have known, but they didn't catch it. But, you know, we've caught it. And I hope that everyone can catch and know it. Now, I was very blessed when I went to school. Uh, then that coming fall uh, after that service, when I went to school, one of our teachers from Moody Bible Institute, a very prayerful woman, she had had polio as a young as a youth and therefore she could not participate perhaps in a lot of activities that other could. But God had revealed to her that before Elijah comes, uh, before Christ comes back to the earth, Elijah must come first. Because of Matthew chapter 17 verse 10 and verse 11, it's very clear when they ask Jesus, why do the scribes teach that Elijah must first come? And then Jesus said truly, Elijah shall first come, and the word shall is in future tense in the, in the Greek language, shall first come and restore all things, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 11. So then he referred to John the Baptist who had already come. They did to him what they listed and so shall they do to the Son of Man. And certainly they took John's life because of, a, uh, because of his preaching was against sin <laughs> uh, and against uh, remarrying to divorce people. And so anyway, uh, he... Uh, uh, he gave a little key there, but may I just, just go and make one more statement. In Revelation chapter 11, there are two messengers that come on the scene, and if you will notice the miracles they did, they did the same miracles of Moses 
and Elijah. Amen. And so that would be his fifth, uh, his fifth appearing, which would be future tense if I understand the scripture. And I believe the Holy Ghost is beginning to reveal the things that's just about to come to pass. So we'll be ready and be prepared. Can you say amen to amen. that? So anyway, I must go back. I must go stay in Hot Springs just a few more minutes. Uh, when, uh, when I came, uh, the little woman that I told you was out in the front. They put her here in front of the pulpit. And when I sat down after introducing Brother Branham, a man behind me, a preacher from Virginia, I won't say any more than that, but he said, he can't heal nobody. Real, real quiet, he didn't say it loud, but I'm just in front of him and I heard it. And I just tapped him on the knee, I shouldn't have, but I whispered, he doesn't claim to do the healing. <laughs> He claims God does the healing. But I was correct in saying what I said. It was just the wrong time probably to say it. He was a little upset. Later he started whispering and I finally asked him to hold his peace that I wanted to hear the message. And then he got real quiet for quite a while. And Brother Brandon was just preaching under a mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit on a message called, Why? Why is the daughter of my people not healed? Is there no physician there? And so, uh, then Brother Branham walked over to the right hand of the platform from the pulpit. And when he was over there, I heard the man whisper again, said, watch him. He'll pray for those that you can't see what's wrong with them, but he won't pray for those on the cot. Well, now, I know Brother Branham speaking on the loud system couldn't have heard it with these ears, but I'll tell you, he certainly had another hearing on the inside. Amen. And so he immediately stopped preaching and walked back to the platform and pointed the woman that was in the cot and asked her, did she want to be made whole? <laughs> Amen. Now, she was so weak, she just put her hands on the cot and had her hands up. I could see her lips moving, being on the front seat, but I could not hear any sound whenever. Then he prayed for a little black girl whose leg was normal for about a... 11 or 12 year old girl, but the one leg was swollen that I don't think I'm exaggerating and I didn't measure it, but Brother Brenham asked your father to measure it that night, come back and tell him the next day. And I just have to confess to you, I didn't see the man, nor did I learn what he said the next day. But now, I've been praying all afternoon for the woman because I promised them. Brother Branham come back to the woman and he said this, why lay you here till you die? And he said, now the doctor said sent you home to die. I had learned that in the morning. He said, if you lay there, you're going to die. And that, anyone could have told her that. But he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up, go home well. Amen. She come off of the cot like a two-year-old kid and just begin to jump up and down. It's okay to rejoice, you know, Amen. when the Lord does something mighty for you. Amen. It's perfectly all right. And so she just, you could hear her all over the auditorium, which is twice or three times bigger than this auditorium that we're in now. And it was packed out and people standing around the walls. So I'm glad to tell you, I got to see her that night as she walked out. I happened to be right behind her and she had the cover that uh, from her cot under her arm, walking, 
on her own strength. Praise Amen. Amen. By the, well, maybe I should say, and by the strength of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. She was walking with the cover under her arm. So anyway, as I went over then the, on Thursday and uh, had the interview in the, in the motel room, as I excused myself because I had to make arrangements for the service that night. And uh, so Brother Branham said to me, just a minute, Brother Johnson. So I turned and gave my undivided attention. And uh, so I said, yes, sir. He said, I just wanted to say to you, I really appreciate the spirit that you manifest. I said, Brother Branham, I would appreciate that uh, compliment from anybody. But having sat in your presence for two hours and knowing what you know about me for now, <laughs> there is no compliment I would appreciate more than that. So he let me go. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that night, on a Thursday night, when he preached Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever, I had the privilege to pay him a compliment. And I'm just going to tell you what I said. I said, uh, I found it a great privilege to introduce to you Brother William Branham. I said, uh, one of the greatest men of God on earth since Jesus and the apostles. You know, I still feel the same way tonight. Amen. So Brother Branham, and I'm reading exactly what he come to the pulpit to say in his message uh, that, that Thursday night. He said, thank you. Uh, brother, and they, they put in there, Brother Samuel Johnson. And there's a lot of Johnsons, but I'm one that's called Samuel. Mm -hmm. Amen. He said, God bless you. And I said, God bless you, Brother Branham. He said, my. He said, I would have to live some to live up to a reputation like that, wouldn't I? He said, I certainly appreciate that though, if there was no one believed, what good would it do for me to go? And he went on just to, to compliment and, and to mention that he was thankful for what had been spoken. And by the way, when he went back to Jeffersonville, I'm just going to jump ahead uh, two or three days. On Sunday morning, he preached a message entitled the third exodus and if you will just read and hear the first 10 minutes of his message he complimented the 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 abc camp meeting and what a bunch of he's he complimented the women and uh, the good spirit the spirit of unity and so forth that's all I'm going to say, but uh, I appreciated the compliment. But he gave a little warning. He said, I had to go there. He said, that little group is going into something. And, you know, when I first heard it, I didn't, I didn't know exactly what, what happened. But it is true. It is true. The very next convention we had, there was people from South Bend, Indiana, trying to get this group to join in an apostolic organization that, that unites all churches all, all around the world. And he was really working on me. And I said, no, sir. I said, uh, I do not plan to join anything bigger than this but I probably will become free of all systems because it's something about the systems that politics has a way of getting in. That's all I'm going to say for now, but I, uh, I just want to move on as much as I can. On the way from Hot Springs, I felt led in my spirit that on my way back to Michigan, I think I preached for my dad 
maybe one or two other places in Louisville area. And so I felt led to stop in Tupelo where Sister Ruby Martin, who was the first one that I remembered to <coughs> tell me before Jesus comes back, Elijah has to come. And so my wife and I agreed that it would be good to invite her here to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so she at first said, I don't make quick decisions. I said, where have you been? I said, we've been in a convention in Hot Springs. I said, Brother Brenham was our main speaker uh, this year. Oh, tell me what happened with her little shiny eyes. Uh, and when I told her some things that happened, she said, do you think this could be the Elijah? Oh, I wish I knew then what I know right now. <laughs> Amen. But when I told her that, uh, that I had the seven seals in my car right then, and that I wanted her to hear them, and you know what? She changed her mind, and she made a quick decision. Said, could you wait about 30, 40 minutes for me to pack? And she came to Ann Arbor, which was very good for me because I wanted her to hear all of those tapes. So I was playing tapes day and night, you know, so she could hear those tapes of the seven seals. And if I had it to do over, I'd do it again. And anyway, she's gone on to be with the Lord now. May God bless her believing soul. Amen. So anyway, uh, we heard that, and uh, so that was that was Hot Springs, Arkansas. The other meeting that we uh, was able to attend, we attended quite a few meetings in Phoenix, Arizona, Zona, in uh, Long Beach, California. We went to hear Brother Branham, and uh, in Assembly of God Church, a very Nice church, nice pastor. The platform was full of preachers. But when he quoted Acts 2.38, I was the only one to say amen. <laughs> amen. And I still believe not only that, but I want to believe the whole Bible amen. is the Word of God. Do you amen. believe that? Amen. Well, good. I'm glad that you also believe that. So, uh, after we, uh, after we uh, went to Louisville, Mississippi, 1964, my dad called me and asked me would I come uh, to lead the song service for William Branham's meeting in Louisville, Mississippi in, I believe it was April of 1964. And so uh, I was happy to do that. And uh, I am not going to take a long time because I want to try to cut it short. But I, I do want to say the meetings were, were very, very uh, well attended by many people all around the area and even out of state. They came there to hear his message. In his discernment, he discerned that there was people in that auditorium that didn't believe in him. That's the only time I remember, you know, I'm sure he deserted in other places, but he mentions it in the campaign. And I had uh, an aunt that attended and an uncle that attended that meeting. And I remember sitting here on the platform on the right-hand side when he was ministering and began to minister to the sick as he often did uh, without, without a prayer card. And he called my aunt out on the front seat and said to her, you're really concerned about that cancer on your breast. Only her and her doctor and her husband knew about it. She had kept it even from her children, according to them. And so I, uh, I, I remember that he also mentioned about 
other things uh, to her and that should have just give her great faith. But her husband and uh, maybe her, they disagreed with one thing that Brother Branham said that I think it was, uh, it was for the sake of someone in the auditorium. They disagreed with one statement. Brother Branham said any, any true Christian would take their child to a doctor to find out what's wrong with them. And, and they, they did not agree with that. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't trying to teach that only doctors can help you because he taught that God heals by many ways and that he can help you. Now he said the doctor can cut the place and take something out of you, but he said only God can heal the place up where he cuts. And that is exactly the truth. So he uses many things. Anything that will help you comes from God. Amen. I believe we can say that Amen. Without, any, uh, without any doubt. But in 1965, I, I went through uh, some things as I was praying. I could not sleep for some reason. I, I don't know whether it seemed like I was caught up in the spirit to the point that everything was so excited <laughs> that sleep just hardly come. But it was during the month of January that I was praying. And I prayed for my wife who was about uh, three months from delivering a child. And I prayed that it would be a girl because she wanted a girl so much. I also prayed for a house somewhere out in the edge of town or the country because my dad had given me a horse. And when I finished praying for those two things, I heard a voice not more than nine feet from where I was praying. And it said, did I not say I would give thee the desire of your heart? And I said, Lord, is that you? I didn't see anyone, but when I asked him, is that you? His answer came, did I not say I would give you the desire of your heart? And then I started praising him and thanking him. And so I was going to go wake up my wife, but it was 2.30 in the morning, and I didn't want to wake her up. But I thought I'd read the Bible a little bit, and about 4.30 I became a little sleepy. I thought, well, I'll just lay down real easy. If she wakes up, I'll tell her. And she's here as a witness uh, to this. And so I, uh, about 4.30 I went in and eased in bed real quietly. And she said, have you been up all this time? Yes, I've been praying. I have a message for you. What? And I said, yeah, the Lord told me you're going to have a little girl. Well, I would hate to get my hopes built up and, and uh, then be disappointed. Oh, I said, I have enough faith for both of us. <laughs> so uh, I said, also, we're going to get a house out in the country. I don't know when. And... Uh, said, how do you know that? I said, the same one that told me about the little girl. And so the girl come in three months, the house come in three years because I'm riding down the road. God had sent a family all the way from Phoenix, Arizona that wanted to live here because they'd heard me preach two or three times in Phoenix. They'd gotten a job and wanted a house to live in. But the house they found that they knew would be plenty of big, uh, uh, they finally would not rent it to them. So when I said, Lord, the girl come just like you said, what about the house? And the little voice said, did you consider the house that was for sale or rent? And so that's how we found the house at 4259 Dexter and Arbor Road. I drove right to it and um, made an appointment uh, to see the husband that night. He was not at the house at the time. 
So anyway, God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. So one night while I was going through this, now I just say this for the glory of God, and I, I was laying in another bedroom because I didn't want to keep my wife awake. But I had a vision that night of Brother Branham. He was standing out away from me. And of course, having been with him, having sponsored him in these meetings, I knew it was Brother Branham. And so uh, all of a sudden, he just began to lift up, lift up. And I watched him till he went into the clouds and the clouds just uh, shut in behind him. But when he went in, I noticed, I noticed that uh, there was some opposition. There was some opposition because I saw him, I saw him hit something real hard. And I could, you know, at first I didn't see what he was hitting. But when he went in, black shadows, like sheets, come floating down to different parts of the earth. And so, anyway, the devil, the devil was there to say, well, you're going to miss the rapture, you know. And uh, I said, well, I said, uh, uh, I don't believe that I'm going to miss it. And uh, uh, so, but I watched it. And I saw when those dark shadows came among the, the people that had a little revelation, you know, there began to be, there began to be confusion and, and arguing, and, and we have seen that begin to come to pass, I believe. Uh, I believe all of you would agree with that. But anyway, anyway, uh, I, I was happy. Uh, that I got to see that. Brother Branham later in one of his sermons, he said, now when you, the bride of Jesus Christ, goes up, Satan is going to come down. Amen. And so it's not just him, but all believers, when they go, amen, there isn't room for you who are overcomers and the devil too. Amen. Right. And so 12th chapter Revelation very distinctly shows what happens when the man-child goes up and those who believe. Amen. So anyway, uh, I wanted to just, just mention that. Uh, it was in 1965, I'll just say one sentence or two, was my first trip to Honduras, Central America. And I thought it was wonderful that God uh, did not send me to the mission field until first I heard a further revelation of his word, which we call the message of the hour. Amen. I think that's a good word. Amen. And so there a church uh, from the one church that we visited, I believe the last count I heard was at least 150 churches. Plus it's gone into Nicaragua, El Salvador, all the way down into South America also. So we are grateful to the Lord. I went to take a portable preacher, the first little PA system that was taken down. They didn't have any uh, at all, but it played the real tapes. If you remember the old real tapes, it also played a 78 RPM record. It had two mics and it also had two speakers. Could speak pretty easily to 250 to 300 people without any trouble. So the saddest story we heard in our lifetime, probably other than my own mother and dad that passed away, was that Brother Branham had been in an accident. And then a few days later, in December of 1965, he went to be with the Lord Jesus. And so I determined to go to the service. We heard T.L. Osborne preach at that, at that uh, particular time at the funerals in the church. 
at Branham Tabernacle. I remember, and I don't tell very many people this, but I might as well just confess up and tell the truth. When I walked by the casket, I just said this, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Because Elisha had said that when he uh, saw Elijah going up. You remember that? And I didn't holler or scream. I probably should have. But there were signs in the very sun that day. And I stood there and watched it as something was going around, around in the very sun. Signs, the Bible had promised there would be signs. And certainly there were signs. And we may not understand everything. We don't have to understand everything. Right. We just believe Amen. what the Word of God told Amen. us. Amen. Amen. And by the grace of God, we have the promise. I said, we have the promise. Right. Amen. Amen. That when this life is over, Amen. we're going to join in with the overcomers from all the ages who believed in Him with all of their hearts. That's right. And those, according to Romans chapter 8, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead must dwell in us. Right. That's right. And that same Spirit will raise you from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're going to get to have the same address. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All will have the same address. May you study the Word, and may you believe His Word, and never doubt as long as you live, because He is a faithful God. Amen. And we've enjoyed uh, speaking these things to you tonight, and hopefully it'll go out. I just want to take one moment to tell you the name of the messages in Southgate, California, that we sponsored there, and I would like to just name them to you so that you can hear them for yourself. Forgive me, the print is a little smaller, and I'm going to need a little help. But the first night uh, he preached in California, he preached a message called, Be Not Afraid. And then the next morning after that first service, he went to the Hebrew uh, Christian uh, synagogue and he preached their path of life. Then the second night he preached uh, confirmation and evidence. And then, of course, he preached testing, uh, letting off the pressure. And, and so he preached why? And he preached perseverance. That's the one in, in 623, 1962. That's the one he spoke to me. And finally, he preached super sign. That was Southgate, California. So while I got your attention, I want to just also name the name of this, of this message that he preached in Hot Springs, Arkansas. The first night is why. The second night was Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And then, O oh Lord, just once more. That was a wonderful message. All of them were wonderful. And finally, the last night, he preached a greater than Solomon this year. Anyway, may the Lord help us to understand these things that have been given to us because in the book of Revelation chapter 10 and I want to quote one verse in chapter 7 he said now in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he begins to sound the mystery of God King James Version says should be finished. The original says shall be completed. Amen. And so I like that, shall 
be completed. It's God's promise to us. And I think we all believe it. May God bless you as we just stand together now to be dismissed and to sing a song if my wife could make it to the organ. I would like to sing a song by the help of the Lord. Amen. Join in with me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amazing Grace, page two in the Only Believe songbook. <clears throat> if you would just be willing to uh, turn there with us and let's sing it together because all of us are here by Amazing Grace. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. amen. Right. Hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but Sunday and be praying for Brother Dan who's going to be preaching the word. Praise Brother Lord. Dan, would you lead us in prayer now at this time? Amen. Father, we thank you that we